Welcome back. Our next guest is Stacey Dietrich. Stacey is an award-winning 18-year law enforcement officer, author, media consultant, and former detective specializing in sex crimes. With past training by a former FBI behavioral specialist, Stacy is certified through the National Institute of Truth Verification as an examiner. She has also been assigned to a federal drug task force and has been involved in the investigations of numerous homicides. In 2002, Stacy received the Victims of Crime Award from former Ohio Attorney General Jim Petro. As a certified law enforcement instructor, in 2009 she was honored with a commendation by the Ohio House of Representatives for Personal Achievement. She has instructed on topics ranging from sexual assaults to stranger dangers. Stacy is the author of C.C. Gallagher book series and just completed her fourth book titled The Rapture of Omega. Hi, Stacy. Welcome to the show. Hi, Stacy. Hi. Hi, girls. Thanks for having me. Uh, Stacy, the first question I have for you, well, actually, it's more or less I want you to explain your background in law enforcement. You have quite an extensive background in the law enforcement field. I, Can you explain that to us a little I bit? Do. <laughs> I do. I actually grew up with a father who's a police officer, and he had three brothers who were also police officers and cousins, and they all joined the Mansfield, Ohio Police Department in 1969, all Vietnam veterans. And interestingly enough, my mother's family, her two brothers, were also police officers in the Cleveland area. So I was surrounded by law enforcement literally at birth. It was just fascinating to me, you know, to watch my dad come home every night and tell these stories of catching bad guys and all the things that he had to do on his job. And so at an early age, again, I was really fascinated with it. I think I read my first true crime book when I was only eight years old, which nowadays that would be shunned upon. And God forbid I ever saw my eight-year-old reading some of these horrific true crime books. But I did. And again, was fascinated with it. When kids were in high school out going to proms and partying, I was actually writing, doing what we called ride-alongs with my father at work. I was able to just go like once a month and ride along with him on night shift in his cruiser. So it was really neat for me. It was kind of a no-brainer what I was going to do when I graduated. How old were you when you went on your first ride-along? I was 15, and actually the very first night was the very first night I saw my first dead body in the field, and it just terrified me at the time. Yeah, and it was scary, but that age, I hate to say this, it sounds so crass, but it was exciting. Now, after doing it for 20 years, I no longer find that exciting. I find it very horrific, and at the time, at 15, I wasn't dealing with the families of the victims and things like that. It was like watching it on TV, people that like crime shows, but when you're actually out there doing it, you see the fallout from what occurs with all of that. And so it was different, but it did lead me and continue to lead me to a law enforcement career. Now, you also, you've done, when you've gotten calls during your career, you've gotten domestic violence calls as well. Am I correct? Hundreds, if not thousands, yes. Yes, and a friend of mine who was a law enforcement officer in New York City, he told me that those are the, the most dangerous calls that law enforcement is called out to, correct? They're horrific, and you'll see that some of the officer-involved deaths on duty tend to arise from domestic disputes. I actually lost a very dear friend and coworker of mine on Christmas night 2007. He worked alongside my husband on night shift. My father was his lieutenant on night shift. I had known him for 15, 20 years because I was at the sheriff's office, and he was at the city police department. Our families were friends. Our daughters played together. Yeah. He actually Aww. was murdered by his own brother on Christmas night. His brother was a corrections officer at the state prison here in Mansfield and, and just had been building up a slew of mental problems. And Brian, in the course of his duties, his name was Brian Evans, went there to try to talk his own brother down and subsequently got shot and killed by his own brother. And Brian's wife was shot. And Larry Evans, Brian's brother, also shot at upwards of 19 law enforcement officers that night. So that was probably the worst domestic act I had ever been a part of in law enforcement. It was horrible. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this friend of mine, he told me, he said, and I didn't understand it at the time because I said, well, wait a minute, you're a law enforcement officer. You guys carry guns. 
you know, people look up to you guys and they respect you, but when they're in such a hostile situation and so violent and so it's that comment of seeing red, they don't care who's there. They're just going to get somebody, you know, these abusers. That's the right. key phrase there is emotions in domestic situations. Emotions are at an all-time high. You're talking about love and hate and anger and fear all wrapped up into one, and these are powder cakes. When you go to these situations, I know personally when we're responding to a domestic violence, you know, you've got the, it's typically the wife, which, you know, we can get into vice versa, which, you know, with the male being abused, which I have seen as well. But it's typically the woman, and it's very intense. You've got her on the phone. If there's a weapon involved, it's very scary for law enforcement because this abuser is in this home saying, hey, I don't give a shit who you are. I don't care if you're the cops. This is my wife. This is my home. I run this home. You're not coming in here, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep you out. And that's where it gets really, really scary. I remember one night I could monitor my husband's radio traffic on the radio when I was working as well, and he responded to a domestic and was standing in the living room and was talking on the radio, and you could literally hear a shotgun go off in the house where the husband killed himself upstairs in the bedroom, my husband didn't even know he was up there. So for me, I was like, you know, oh my it scared me to death. Yeah, I'm like flying yeah. 120 miles over to the south. But, I mean, things, scary things like that happen on uh, domestics, and they're, they're very scary, they're very dangerous, and we take the utmost caution when we're responding to calls like that. So, Stacy, then I would think the advice to people and our listeners who are listening now, if there is someone in their family or someone they know, or maybe even somebody they don't know, who's involved in a domestic dispute, don't get personally involved because now you're putting yourself into danger. What other route should they take as opposed to getting in between somebody, for instance? That would not be the route to take, correct? Let me see if I understand your question. If you have, a, a like, a friend that's in a domestic situation, should you or should you not get involved? Is that what you're Right. What, what I'm saying is, yeah, for, if, for anybody who's listening, I'm asking if the advice would be then to not get directly involved in a domestic dispute while it's going on. You've got to be careful, but if I see a friend that's in trouble, I'm, I'm getting involved. But I also um, am familiar enough with domestic violence to know how involved to get because what people don't understand is sometimes you can get so involved that you're actually putting that person in greater danger. If you're one of those friends that you you, you front off the husband and say, hey, you touch her again, I'm going to call the police and do the doubt. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to go back into that house and front that wife off and say, you're running your mouth to your friends and she's going to take a whole heck of a beating because of that. So you have to be very, very careful. I think friends should intervene. And when I say by intervene, they need to start to gather a whole pile of information for some of these women on their out. What are the resources for them? What can they do? Because what most of these women are scared of the most is they don't know what to do. They don't know that there's shelters. They don't know that there's CPOs. Right. They have no income. When, who's going to watch my child? But they're, yeah, they have all these fears. I have no income. I have no job. What they don't realize are there is just a wealth of resources out there for women like that that can help them through that process. And that is what I find is the biggest hurdle that they come across. Every domestic, well, I can't leave. I don't have a job. Who's going to watch my kids? Where am I going to live? And we can provide them with this. So if you're a friend and you see somebody, don't get directly involved because, again, what you might think you're helping, you might actually be making the situation a whole lot worse. But behind closed doors, you can be finding out these resources for her to get out and get out safely. Right. And obviously, if it's a volatile situation or a violent situation, you would want to call 911. But I think what I was trying to express was, if you're in the room and and a domestic violence situation breaks out with somebody that you know, it's dangerous, actually, to get directly involved or to try and jump in the middle unless that's something, you know. And and that's where I was going with it. Maybe you could do something alternative. No, I absolutely never recommend that. No, I mean, if you see that... So to jump, you mean to like jump on the husband and try and pull him off? Absolutely not. No, I would never recommend that. I would recommend, you know, trying to get away from the situation, run out to the front yard if you have to, and call 911 or the neighbors, yeah. whatever. But get on the phone to 911. Never, ever try to. If you're a 
six foot, 300 pound guy see this going on and you know you can take the husband, yeah, go for it. But, you know, if you're just a little gal and you see your friend in need, call 911. Yeah. Okay. That's, and I apologize, I didn't express that well the first time, but that's, I I'm think, sorry, I just went rambling on. And <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that was good information too, though, because that's applicable as well for people to, when they know that their friends or their loved ones or somebody's in a situation like this, they do need to start gathering information and helping them get resources so that they don't have all of these reasons, at least on a survival level, to Yes, yeah, they convince themselves to stay, to stay because right. of this. And they just don't realize for every argument they have to stay, there is a resource out there that should be telling them to go. They have the resources out there. They just aren't aware of it. I mean, it gets so bad and people don't realize, well, why don't they just leave or research it on the computer? I mean, some of these guys, you know, they are going through cell phones, going through their computer history. That is what they do all day long are monitor the activities of their wives. And it's very difficult for some of these women to try to reach out to somebody to find these resources. So, you know, if you you are a friend and you're able to do that behind closed doors, I say absolutely try to help her out. Have you noticed that in a lot of the neighborhoods there's the Neighborhood Watch program? Have you heard about that? Yeah, Neighborhood Watch has been around for quite a while. We really utilize that in our area, and domestics are a big part of that. They hear what appears to be a domestic violence in progress, and they will call. Now, on the flip side of that, As many calls of those that I've received, I get just as many, and this makes me so angry, where I'll go to a domestic to the point the woman's in the hospital, and there's just no way neighbors didn't hear it, and we always talk to the neighbors for potential witnesses, and I'll talk to some of these people, and they're like, yeah, that's been going on for like a month, and he does that to her every night, and you look at these people, and you want to slap them upside the head, and you're like... And you didn't call the police. Why? Well, that's not my problem. I'm not getting involved in that. They're my neighbors. I don't want any problems. You know, really? Come on. Are you serious? Yeah, this is where these two women in Northern California, they started this program because domestic violence was not a part of their neighborhood watch program. So they started talking to the police. And, you know, instead of if you don't want to make that call, designate somebody in your neighborhood to make that call if they hear it. Let that person know that's going to be making that call to 911 because it really is. I mean, you could be saving someone's life. And here's what people don't realize. You don't have to give your name. You can make an anonymous call to the police that at 1234 Main Street, this guy is literally beating the crap out of his wife. Thank you very much. Goodbye. They're required to respond to those. Even if they're anonymous? Yes, absolutely. Well, see, and that's great to know because I think a lot of people are fearful. And, you know, everything, people, they start working on that fear and, you know, they're afraid and they're afraid and they're afraid and nobody does anything and somebody ends up losing their life. And that's sad. You're not required to leave your name to report a crime. You can report it, hang up. And by law, I mean, we are responsible. We are required to go to every one of these calls to see 911 hangups. Oh, I hear a, I hear what sounds like a child screaming in the woods. It's A, B, and C lane. We have to go to every one of those and close out the call. I mean, we're required by law to do that. So no, if you hear someone screaming or you hear what sounds to be like a domestic situation, pick up the phone and call. All police departments have non-emergency numbers to where your information does not pop up on the screen. 911, yes, but all police departments have non-emergency numbers that just ring into a single line where you can remain anonymous. And if it's that important for you, I would say to anybody, you know, why you wouldn't want to give a statement, you know, to end this type of abuse on your neighbor. I think that's crazy. But if you really want to stay anonymous, just call the non-emergency number and say what's up and hang up. Exactly. And uh, everybody needs to get involved. Everybody needs to do their part. Don't just sit back and think that somebody else is doing it. Get involved. Make that call and help save a life. So thank you for doing what you do. I mean, uh, great and good information because, you know, people don't need to be afraid of the police. You guys are out there to help us and to keep us safe and what it's all about. Now, Stacy, you've also written a few books and you have your latest book, The Rapture of Omega. Yes. <laughs> now, what is that? The Rapture of Omega. <laughs> I know. What? You know, everybody's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We go from cop to writer, like, how does this happen? <laughs> yeah, Jack of all trades. 
I wear many. Well, I was, yeah, I was um, thinking that when you said earlier in the interview that you when you were a teenager, you loved detective books, and I thought, aha, that was an aha moment, because then I realized, well, that's probably where this desire to become an author came from. Is that correct? I had that same aha moment when I actually did start writing, because I was always good at writing. You know, in, in high school and college, my English and composition classes, I excelled in, and I loved to write. Never in a million years say, I'm, you know, I'm going to grow up to be a writer. That just wasn't in the cards. But what happened was it was about six years ago, I had a really interesting case. And my husband and I were building our dream home down here in, in the state forest and were just made a bonfire, drinking a couple of beers like we do here in the Midwest. <laughs> and I was telling him, yeah, we just put bonfires on our front lawn and have a couple of beers. But I was telling him the story and I'm like, this is one of those things that would really make an awesome book. And he's like, well, you should write it. And I'm like, well, what do I know about writing? He goes, oh, no, you could definitely write that. And it kind of scrambled around in the back of my head for six months. And actually, when we moved in, I sat down and, and wrote the first five pages of, of Murder Mountain, which launched my fiction series, which involves a female detective protagonist. Her name's Cece Gallagher. And didn't even intend on getting published. But as I was going along and going along, I thought, well... Let me see, you know, I'll start querying agents if they tell me to keep my day job, then I know I'm terrible. <laughs> but, yeah, but, it's, you know, I was lucky and, and got an awesome agent and, and a book deal. And so, you know, I continued with this fiction series. And The Rapture of Omega actually is the fifth book. And I kind of played on the whole 2012 doomsday thing, I guess you want to, you know, whatever you want to call it, but it was actually spawned by, I think it was the summer of 2007, Jeffrey Lundgren was executed here. He was the lead cult leader of yes. what was called the Kirkland cult killing. He had a cult here yes. in Ohio. And it was like an hour after that, I, I watched this documentary on Jonestown. So I'm like, okay, this is my next book. Basically, what I started off with was I didn't do the 2012 thing. I did the global warming fears, you know, that the world's ending and it brings out all these apocalyptic visionaries and kooks, you know, that are forming these cults, which pay attention. And around next summer, you're probably going to see some of these start popping up with this whole 2012 fear, which is crazy. But you get these crazy people that gather groups and, you know, this is what it is. So anyway, a cult popped up in her jurisdiction and it has a very, very dark ending to it. It's probably the darkest book. I wrote out of the whole so series. All your, I actually, all, your book, all your books are fiction books. <laughs> no, no, I actually do true crime. I oh, have okay. Murder Behind the Badge, which is a compilation of stories of cops that have actually committed murder, not on duty even. These are cold-blooded murderers that were police officers. Drew Peterson, Bobby Cutt, they're included in that book. I have my memoir, which is my life as a female police officer. And I actually have three more coming out, including the story of Sandra Cantu. She was the eight-year-old abducted child in Tracy, California, that was murdered and raped by a female Sunday school teacher, Melissa Huckabee. And I spent 18 months on that book. Where it was a horrible, horrible story. I'm not quite sure what the release date of that is yet. And I also have a compilation of the nation's most prolific child abduction dating back to the 1800s. So. Oh, so you have quite a few books out there. And then along with yeah, those, I, you have the C. Gallagher series, which is, that's the yeah, fiction Yeah, I have the series. Gallagher series, and I have the true crimes, and then the memoir. So We'll make them available on our website as well, so our oh, listeners can go in. Well, that's great. But no, domestic violence, and, and I know I had talked to Denise about this before, and, and law enforcement sometimes puts a Band-Aid on within itself, some types domestic violence within law enforcement and that murder behind the badge book was just a really stark view of some huge red flags with certain officers that ultimately wound up with them murdering their spouses that I believe the departments could have prevented that and that in itself is a whole other topic but I think you know just that book in particular really really hones down on that. Stacy, the wrath of other police officers when you wrote that book. I mean, how intense did they get on you? I mean, that must not be crazy. At all. No, not, not at, at all. all. No, no. And actually one of the stories was a lieutenant that I had grown up with had gotten a local prostitute pregnant and murdered her and threw her, you know, down in a creek 
And I included that story because at the time was just this unheard of, you know, the police officer commits murder. And I included that case. I expected to get local flack from that, but um, no, yeah, no. You know what? The bottom line is, the majority of police officers are good people. They do not want to be working with people like this. They don't want to be working with people like Bobby Cutts or Drew Peterson. Right. And, you know, up until they committed the murders, if you talk to their coworkers, they weren't very well liked to begin with. That's good to hear because there's so many people out there that believe that police officers are corrupt or they cover up for each other or they all know what's going on. And so it's good to hear that that's not the case and for the, to let the listeners know that that is not the case and that most police officers you know, are good people. It's to the point anymore that everybody's so happy to just have a job that the thin blue right. line, yeah, we, we will take care of each other no matter what. But if my friend dared and my coworker dared to put me in a position which would compromise my home, my kids, my freedom. Shame on them. You know, how dare you do that to me? How dare you put me in that position? You know, so you're on your own. And that's pretty much the the common feel nowadays amongst police officers. Hey, I got your back no matter what, but don't you ever put me in a position that's going to compromise my family and my home because you're on your own. And that's just the way it is nowadays. We don't want bad people. You know, we get enough press. You know, it's it's always the the bad stuff. You don't see these heroes every day out there doing things. It's it's more sexy to see the bad cop doing this on the nightly news. And, And we don't want that. And I work with some of the most amazing people and that would literally give you the shirt off their back. And and we want to maintain that. We're not going to compromise well, that for anybody. And this is something that we have to get out to the masses because we've got one a police officer here in uh, Laguna Beach, California. And when my son was growing up, when he was younger, I'm telling you, that guy, he was going after these teenage boys. You can't skateboard. You can't walk. You can't talk. You can't chew gum. I mean, it was literally, he was the most hated police officer. And I thought, wow, you guys want to turn around your reputation and you want to become known as, you know, because firemen are loved and you want to have that reputation when you, te- when, you, when you scream at the kids, you don't let them do anything, they can't even walk and chew gum and talk at the same time and you're giving them tickets. You want to know what we call those officers because every department what? has a handful. We're like, yeah. those are the kids that got picked on in school. <laughs> I hate to say that. But we all have a handful of officers like that that are just so ridiculous that we're like, you obviously were bullied in school and became a police officer. Yeah, so that they could turn around and bully again. I mean, yeah, but the great thing is that it, it, a majority of them are good and they are out there to help, and that's really wonderful. And we just have to keep letting people know that they are here to help you and they will take the shirt off their back in order to do so. So I think that's fantastic. So, Stacy, listen, thank you so much for sharing with us. It was wonderful having you on the show. And, you know, we'll revisit this again. <laughs> thank you so much. You guys have a great day. You too. Take uh-huh. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay tuned in. We'll be right back. If you need a voice for your e-learning project or corporate video, contact Ken Maxson's VoiceWorks at www.ineedavoiceover.com. We'd like to thank both our guests for joining us tonight and sharing some great information. For guest and other show information, visit us at detoxradio.com. That is D T A L K S radio.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Detox Radio Show and find us on Facebook by clicking the Facebook icon on our website. See you next week. Good night. Good night. If you would like information about upcoming shows or are interested in booking a speaker, visit www.detoxradio.com. Thank you for listening to Detox Radio with Denise and Danielle. Be sure to tune in next week for another great show.